type systems. There is the uh, common list music system, which has been around for a while. There's a uh, music notation system called LilyPond or in Scheme. Uh, lots of other people have done all kinds of cool stuff with Lisp and music. And in fact, the uh, the original creators of Emacs and Emacs Lisp were all pianists. So uh, this probably makes sense once you've learned some of the Emacs keyboard commands, how that came about. Uh, so now, finally, Closure gets to participate in the game, and we have uh, Sam Aaron here to talk about us, here to talk about uh, overtone and music synthesis. Okay. Probably that's true if I can't because really knows more about this than myself. Um, I must say I'm a complete beginner in this, and I guess what I'm about to show you is sort of a tribute to the fact that if you spend a year doing something, you can learn how to how things work and really get involved. And if you don't know about something, that's not a problem, just, just have an open mind. Um, I've changed the title, as you obviously can notice. Um, this is a play on another book which I read a while ago called Notes on the Synthesis of, of Four by Crystal Alexander. Um, and I don't know, has anyone read this book? How many people read this book? Okay, more people need to read this book. It's brilliant. It's written in the 60s. Chris Alexander talks about uh, design in, in a brand new way, and he combines uh, uh, notation and language and process, and he had diagrams like this. And Chris Alexander is an architect, and he was drawing diagrams like this, um, and, and it had a profound impact on my thought. And I won't go into more detail because I'm going to talk about music, but all I'm trying to say is that if you look at different contexts, then you can bring interesting things out of those contexts and apply them to other places. And so, Chris, Chris, Chris Alexander's main work, really, that had an influence on the software community, was the time to where building, which talks about patterns. And so, the whole notion of design patterns came from that. And so, here, here we have an example where we're taking ideas from architecture and bringing them to the software world. And so, what can we do in terms of other fields? Is, is a music an interesting place where we actually spend time researching computing ideas? Uh, can we actually find new approaches to computing by looking at new contexts like music? So really, that's, that's what I'm trying to say here. Um, and so, although we do a lot of things in business software and web development things, other contexts can be really interesting for really technical, sophisticated research. Um, and the next point I want to make is that uh, I want to talk about Kasparov. So uh, this is Kasparov in his second rematch where he lost against Deep Blue uh, in 1996. Uh, and this was a really interesting point in time. So here we have a famous chess player, world grandmaster, finally beaten by somebody else who wasn't actually a person. Um, although you have a human face, it is the IBM guy actually choosing what, making the moves on the chessboard. Um, and the thing is, what do you do when you're the grandmaster of chess and you're beaten by a computer? What's the next step? <laughs> Team up with the computers. <laughs> so we created something called advanced chess, where basically you'd be like the guy on the right, cheating. You'd have a your laptop open, whatever thing you wanted, whatever chess programs, whatever databases of previous moves you wanted, at your disposal, and you would use those to help you play chess. And so this is what he invented, advanced chess. And he said it was brilliant. So people claimed it was cheating and it wasn't, wasn't really in the spirit of chess. But for him, it freed his mind. So he could not worry about whether it was a strong move or a tactical thing, or whether it would make a tactical blunder. He could focus on the psychology of the game and the tactics and just think about the other person and the gameplay. And all the stuff he liked about chess, he could focus on. Um, and what was really interesting about this is they had a competition, online competition, freestyle. Anyone could make a move however they wanted. So humans, computers, combinations. We all enter this competition. He'd been practicing with his grandmaster chess friends for a long time, you know. Like, I'm going to win this, I'm the grandmaster, or ex-grandmaster, and I've got, I've got my computers. Um, and what was interesting is that human plus computer would always be a beat computer. So he was actually be able to beat Deep Blue with this approach. But two random guys from America won, beat everybody, beat, beat Kasparov. They wanted to have heard of these guys, amateur chess players. And it was a real shock to Kasparov. And he sort of came up with this premise that sort of a weak human or a weak chess player plus a machine plus a better process was superior to a strong computer alone and more remarkably superior to a strong human, so him, strong chess, plus machine plus an inferior process. So if we can use process in interesting <coughs> ways, we can beat people. You know, we can beat people who practice for their lives. Uh, and I think that's a really interesting position. How can we apply this to other contexts outside of chess? Does this apply to music? Does this apply to other domains? I believe so. And so the, the reason why I'm talking about these two things is um, it's really interesting to explore other domains. I think that's a rich place to actually look at things. And also, if we use computers well and we actually understand how to formalize process and we have cool ways of doing that, I think that we can actually 
triumph and, and, and take, place, take us out to interesting places we've never been before. Um, and we really need to sort of pick apart what we mean by the process <coughs> machine and this combination. I'll talk about them a bit. Um, which then brings me to talk about music. Um, so this was one of the first machines that music was made on. Imagine that, you know, imagine that thing, make music. Um, here's a similar recording of something similar to... Oh, it's going on. Oh, go for one. Imagine that thing making that noise. <laughs> and the thing is, like, you can hear in the background, people are laughing, it's quite a music thing, what the hell, this massive expensive business, you know, playing blah, 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 blah. Um, really interesting things. Um, so, the, and the reason why I bring this up is because the state of the art of music making hasn't really changed much since these days. <laughs> um, so, what, what can I do to help change this? So, I started a, a project called In Process, which is to try and combine improvisation and process. We're combining the music and the Actually, the, the uh, common this music from the symbol is extremely similar to that, so I'm, I'm sorry, but it was something that came up in my mind. It's obviously a good idea. Um, and it was a combination of multiple people working on the project, so I got Cambridge University, Anglia Ruskin University, actual musicians, the digital performance lab, uh, people like actual uh, science musicians, and the Microsoft Research University. And so, what are the what are the, the questions we've kind of asked? What's the end goal? Like, how can we get from Bar Bar Black Sheep to, to something much more uh, interesting and, and impressive? Well, so the real end goal is to be like Jimi Hendrix, clearly. Yeah. You, know, you want to be on stage with your eyes shut, playing music and enjoying it. And, and the key here is that the people in the audience can perceive his virtuosity. So they can see that he's a badass guitarist. You know? And it's that being able to see someone's badass is really important. Um, <laughs> seriously, it is. Otherwise, you've got no idea what they're doing. You know? And so combine that to myself and Jeff Rose playing in a Ruby and Rails concert. <laughs> we don't look badass at all, do we? We could be reading our emails, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the state of the art of computer music making. It's rubbish. So we need to improve that. Uh, and uh, it's good I've got Jeff Rose here, because he was actually the, the, the guy who started Overtech, so we need to give him a lot of tributes. Um, and the next thing is, uh, we want to be able to do things like improvise. So we want to be able to change our minds on the fly whilst we're making music. We don't want to have to pre-render everything and just press play maybe tweak some dial things. We want to actually be able to change our, our minds on what we're doing. Um, and what can we do with computer music? We're stuck. You know? we're just, we have no real ability to do that. So all the good computer music has been pre-rendered and pre-made. Um, and another issue is communication. So we want to be able to make bands of people playing computer music together, communicating, working together. So here we've got the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And you can clearly see that they're all working off each other in synchronization, communicating, <coughs> looking at each other, fitting, or fitting the music through their own body language. And here we've got the Princeton University Laptop Orchestra. <laughs> they will be in their own pods, you know, like complete silence of individuality. Maybe they're chatting through IRC or something. <laughs> it's not what we want, is it? It's not good enough. So how can we take this further? Um, and one of the things I think really needs to focus on that binds all these things together is the notion of an interface. So with traditional interfaces, you've got something which is very open and exposed and clear, uh, and it's something that anyone can play with, so a six-year-old can strum a guitar and hear some sounds, and we can all twinkle a wand and have a play, and then when we see someone who's really badass, then we can see the virtuosity. Um, compare that to what we might see as the latest innovation, like this is uh, Ableton Live. How the hell are you going to look at that and see someone's virtuosity? It's just so damn complex. You've got no idea if the person is good or bad because the interface is so complicated. There's no way to reveal it. Plus, how do you project that? Do you put it on a screen like this whilst you're playing? I mean, a lot of laptop players actually try and project the screen of what they're doing. If you've got that on a screen, still you're not communicating what you're doing. So this is a real serious issue. Um, compare that to, say, um, uh, the notate, or another way of looking at interfaces and notation. Um, and this is a way of actually communicating the music as well. So here we have uh, some basic Western common notation describing uh, an Eric Captain song called Labour. And what's really interesting about this is that when I've shown this particular slide to, to musicians, they go, oh, that's a terrible score. That's, that could have been so much nicer. What a really noddy way of doing later. <laughs> and the reason why they could do that is they could read it, and they could see it, and they could see the mistakes, and they could see how it could be improved. They had their insight into that because the notation was clear. What do we have for computer music? We've just got sound waves, really. Now, I can't tell if, if the guy made a fluff on his guitar there. I can't see if he played the wrong notes or it was out of tune or out of time. There's no real way to understand what's going on in there. I can try and do some FFT and do some feature extraction or something, but that's not really what we want. We want to be in the symbol space, not in the sound space. And when we have notation, you can do a lot of good things. 
Okay, so we'll check the time, we've only got 20 minutes at all. That's time we didn't tend to, right? Um, and when we have notation, we do a lot of good things. So we can have like learn as you play books. How do you get started making music? So I can get the Hendrix book and learn how to play some Hendrix. You know, I might not be as good as him, but I'll be able to actually make something which sounds similar. And I'll be excited about that. I can play that to my friends, and they can enjoy it. And it's similar to like when you have friends coming uh, to your house and you cook them some food, they don't expect you to be a Michelin star chef. They want you to make some nice food and talk about it. It's a social thing. So why isn't it the case with music? Why can't we? Uh, get people around and not be expected to be a uh, top performer. Um, and also in notation, you can do amazing things. Like you can you can visualise a lot of complex data. So here we have a, a, a large score, and you can with this a, a musician can look at repeating patterns. They can see time. They can see where the silences are. They can they can infer a lot of information just by quickly glancing at the score. So we need things that allow us to do this kind of stuff. Okay, so that's good. So that's really uh, what we need to be doing. So. Let's bring ourselves back a bit in time and, and look at this uh, old chap. So we talked about people who have unfortunately passed away recently. This is Max Matthews. He passed away recently at the right old age of 84. And he was one of the grandfathers of computer music. Um, and uh, yes, fantastic chap. And in, in, in 1963 or 1964, he wrote this paper that was published in the Science Journal called The Digital Computer as a Musical Instrument. Brilliant. A computer can be programmed to play instrumental music to aid a composer or to compose an aid it. What a fantastic idea. Um, and in this paper, he describes everything that, that's really the, the state of the art in, in, in computer music. So he talks about how you can take streaming numbers and turn them into sound. That's the starting point. So here we have our numbers. We pass them to a digital analog converter. We do a bit of smoothing, and we pass it to a speaker. So essentially, we need numbers between minus 1 and 1, which describe where the speaker code needs to be at any particular point in time. And as long as we send enough of those per unit of time, the speaker will be able to move in and out and generate the sounds. And so the key here is, really is choosing which numbers to send to the uh, speaker. That's, that's what we need to do. So if you can generate the right numbers, you can make any kind of sound. That's, that's the principle. So, uh, and what's interesting here is we, he talks about sample rate being 10,000 numbers per second and really, really like low numbers. So the only thing that's changed is the fact that you can do this far faster rate and, and get much more uh, better quality sound than things. So once we, once we know that all we need to do is to create the right stream of music, and then we can start to focus on things like notation. How do we actually describe what to do through time? So we came up with an idea of that. So we talked about uh, basically a series of function calls which describe modulation parameters. So here we have a bunch of instruments, two in this case. We play each of them through time. We have like a duration and the loudness and uh, the frequency and some other things. And so all we need to do is actually tell the computer to do these one after another and render the sound. It's pretty simple. And then the thing is, what, what do we next need? So we have a way of producing any kind of sound, we have a notation describing how the sound can change through time, but we don't yet have a thing to actually create our instruments. And so he created this notation, um, in which basically uh, you have nodes, which are, are generators of signals, uh, they were called UGENs, unit generators, and you can have envelope unit generators, sine wave unit generators, all sorts of different things. You sort of plug them together so the output of one is the input of another, um, and by doing so, you can actually make interesting sounds. And in his system, he had 10 new gems. It was pretty cool. Um, and he could generate a lot of different things with that. Um, which you compare against modern systems where we have an overtone, we have about 450, which is nice. Um, and so, once you've got all those things, we need to just skip now, sort of 40 years at a time. And, and here's the sort of state of art of, of visual systems. This is Maximus P. And notice it's absolutely the same. There's no difference, really. We've got a slider, and we've got some way of actually visualizing the output in real time, because our computers are better. But really, we've got the same thing. We've got unit generators which are feeding into other unit generators which are generating signals of signals of signals. And that way, we can, by connecting enough of these things together in interesting ways, we can make interesting sounds. But there's one side issue with this, in that although it's great for the demos and, and simple things like this, this looks nice to work with. You can, you can imagine playing with this and changing the sounds. If you want to make something interesting, you need a lot, a lot of these things. And so very quickly, you end up something like this. Um, and here we've got a, a, a multiple uh, samplers playing at the same time. Clearly, it's been cut and pasted. There's no means of abstraction. There's no means of generating samples from samples. Oh, sorry, um, patches from patches. These things are called patches. Um, so there's no higher order functions. You can't pass patches through patches. You've just really got a very basic abstraction. And, and really, you're limited to the kind of complexity you can manage with this kind of visual notation, which is a pain. Um, so what do we do when we're, we're computer scientists and we want to actually deal with these kinds of things? We put them in a box. So this is what SuperCard is. It's that exact same thing in a box, um, except for uh, 
rather than actually dealing with some visual notation on a computer, we actually have a nicely defined API to actually send updates to actually how to modify this internal data structure. So you need to imagine that patch as an internal data structure. Um, and so this is where we are today. This is what Overtone is based on, SuperFlyDev. Uh, and when it was initially conceived, it was this box which had the, the maximum speed star notation inside, which had the different sounds, and it had a language which was also based into the same thing. And uh, James McCartney, who wrote SuperFlyDev, uh, in version 3, he separated the max. So they actually talked over a defined protocol. So the language was a different process, essentially, or potentially, to serve itself. And the reason he did that was to be able to allow the opportunity to explore different languages. Um, so he created the SuperCloud language just because the languages that were available then didn't have the kind of abstractions he wanted to make music. But he observed that things had changed, and, and lots of languages now kind of had contained the kind of things he wanted. And maybe that there wasn't a need to maintain an own separate weird a hybrid of small, it was like basically like a Ruby-like thing himself. And so, go to town with people. I made an opportunity for you to actually try the languages. So why not? So that's what Overtone is. Overtone is a, a closure front-end to the SuperCloud server, so it's essentially a replacement of the SuperCloud language. And we have a, a slightly different focus. So we're interested in live interaction and exploration, so we want to use the record to actually uh, explore and work with sounds. Uh, we want to be able to think about different kinds of abstractions to work with, uh, what might be suitable. We want to do code generation. So we want to generate our synths from code, from, from higher level abstractions. We want to see uh, Oto as a toolkit, so we don't have to use all of it, we can pull apart, so closure namespaces work perfectly for that. And real world connectivity. So we want to be able to use and connect with extra uh, external devices very easily. So we want to be able to talk to serial ports. We want to be able to talk to, to network protocols. Um, we want to be able to talk to databases. We want to return to web services. Whatever you want to actually connect to, to make your music, we want that. So the JVM office this. Um, and so, the next thing to talk about is, uh, obviously the slide's gone off and everyone's talks. <laughs> so, the coolest thing about this slide isn't the fact that you've got the whole computation defined on one slide, it's pretty cool. Um, it's the fact that it's actually composed of these seven parts. And so, this, is, this, this kind of idea is that, sort of, makes you think, what might be interesting base abstractions for music? Um, and so this is the kind of way I'm thinking about it, is how we can create, well, what are the equivalents of these for music? Are there, and what would they be? <coughs> so I want to talk about collaboration very quickly. I've got five minutes, and I've got maybe halfway through my slides. Okay, so things like this. So uh, I created a Cambridge University laptop orchestra. There's two people in it. Um, and this is, a, this is the situation we want to be in. So we've got, uh, there's an extra person here, so if you want to join us, you can be like me. <laughs> um, we have a bunch of patterns to play. So patterns are just uh, a notation of, of when to play beats. Uh, and, and play samples. And basically we want to be able to manipulate those patterns, both of us, uh, concurrently and collaboratively. And so, uh, the reason why I put this up, because I gave this talk at Cambridge University to try and describe uh, why Clojure is a good fit, but obviously you're all aware of this, and it says that if you've got a musical day, shared data structure, you want to have good concurrency semantics to actually guard this and modify it. <laughs> and, and it's not so bad here, here you can just have a queue and a work pulling off it so you can serialize things. But when you want to, to actually potentially modify multiple things at once and coordinate multiple things all over the place, which is exactly what you want to do in a musical context, you need a language that supports this kind of thing. Um, and so, hence Overtone. Okay, so if you, who's here heard of Overtone? Brilliant. Who's got stickers on your laptop? You're all my friends. <laughs> if you don't have stickers, come and find me later, I'll give you one. Um, the good thing about Overtone is we love ASCII art. Um, <laughs> and so we've made a bunch of libraries with Cloud of ASCII art, uh, so I'm going to so here's Atta library, this allows you to schedule things in the future, we've got a serial port library, this <laughs> um, And we also have, at the heart of Overtone is an open sound control server, so if you haven't heard of open sound control, it's, like, it's kind of like the new MIDI, but it communicates over TCP or UDP, um, and it's really super flexible. So here's our uh, ASCII art open sound control, lovely. Um, and, oh, I'm doing it very quickly, it's good. Um, and so, I should also go very quickly through some of the kind of abstractions that, that Overtone supports, just to show you that although it's a musical system, it might sound a bit naughty, it's actually pretty damn technical. And we need a lot of sophisticated ideas in there uh, to actually make it happen. So, here we have uh, our uh, event system, so we have different ways of describing events. So here we're synchronizing an event through time, so we're applying a lambda, when the event occurs, we're doing this thing. Um, and we have two different types. We have on event, which happens in the thread pool. We have on sync event, which happens in the same thread which created the event. Here we're actually using the on sync event. Um, we've got a dependency management system. So when, when multiple dependencies have, have been met, then they call some lambda. Um, 
In this case, uh, Lambda is going to be called when server is connected and the call groups have been created. And we actually will satisfy another dependency, which may trigger off other functions to be called. Which is super useful when you're actually trying to um, uh, start up another external thing. It's a bit like Linux booting up, maybe you've got different starting modes. We, we, we can model up with this. Um, I've also got a very basic, simple, uh, dynamic type system, uh, which allows you to uh, control uh, which messages are sent out to SuperCliner to make sure we don't send rogue messages. So this sort of guards the, the, the domain between no return and SuperCliner. And so we can say, for example, um, the command pass message can only contain an int and multiple anythings. And if it doesn't match that, then we can raise an exception. This is super useful for finding errors. Um, we also have cool musical abstractions. So here's a bunch of scales, nicely modeled. Um, and we have chords. Um, that's far too small, which shows a lot of chords. That's good. Um, and we also have a compiler inside there as well. So here we, we have a, a small hat instrument. But although this looks a bit like code code, and the idea it should look like code code, it's not really. It's, it's our own language. And so the semantics of the things inside there are, are different. And so plus and multiply, for example, do different things. They might be multiplying signals together rather than numbers. Um, and so we actually do literally compile this down to binary format, send it via open sign control to a supercliner server. So there's a lot of, lot of uh, fun business going on in there. Um, and yeah, so let's talk about interface. So although um, code might be a really cool interface, and it's what I'm going to show you later on, I'm, I'm totally happy with that. And hacking in Emacs, as most of you do, is, is a really nice thing. Um, it's not always the best thing. So this. Uh, Hands up, who knows what this is? <laughs> who can read it? Okay, no one knows. It's, this is Why the Lucky Stiff's Camping Framework. One slide, nice. Um, I, I mean, that's good. No one's mentioned Why the Lucky Stiff now yet, so I'm, I'm happy to mention it. And, and I think we need more people like that in communities like this. Um, and who's, who's not heard of Why the Lucky Stiff? Really? Oh, you need to go and read Why it's putting like a Ruby. You might not like Ruby, but the book is amazing. <laughs> we need to make more people write books for cartoons. Um, and the key reason why I'm putting this up is that you might want to work with musicians who look at that and think, what the hell is that? Um, it could be anything, you know? It could be the Matrix. <laughs> I'm seeing lambdas and procs, you know, and arrays and yeah, sets. And, yeah. And so we, we don't want to have them think of they think like this. So how do we deal with the fact that code looks like this to a lot of people? This one is going to take a while to pull off. Um, right, which brings us to uh, modern... Museum of Modern Art in New York. So uh, here we have, uh, I think it's actually just finished this exhibition, it was on for a while. And inside there is this device. And we have one here. Um, so this is Modern Art, how cool is that? Yeah. Um, and the cool thing about this is it's a device which doesn't intrinsically make any audio itself. It's got no sound production capabilities whatsoever. It's just a pure I.O. device. And why would we want such a device? What's interesting about that? Well, consider like the guitar, for example. Um, here are a few chords of the guitar. Um, and a guitarist has to learn a lot of these chords if they want to play the songs which require those chords. And those chords are really a function of the, de the design of the device, the guitar, which itself is a function of the fact it's got to actually produce the sounds. And so the, the, the way it's designed and constructed is all about the actual creation of the sound. And so really that ends up with kind of arbitrary mappings of fingers to actually the chords. Um, and that's not necessarily what you want. It's what you need if you want to make a sound with a physical device. <coughs> But, but we're in the digital age. And so a device like this will allow us to actually make our own kinds of chord patterns, if we want to make chords, which may be squares or triangles or whatever we want, and transposing it, might be moving it around the grid. And, and we can imagine different kinds of interfaces for different kinds of songs. Or even during, during a given uh, performance, the interface might modify and change. So we're really di uh, divorcing the thing which makes the sound from the thing which actually uses it to, to communicate the sound. And we also have other things. This is Touch OS, which is for the iPad or iPhone or Android. And, and the cool thing about this is, you like look at this interface and think, what the hell does that mean? And that's the perfect question to ask. Because you can talk to the musician or the performer and say, what would you like it to mean? And that's a really interesting thing. Rather than saying, this is the instrument, this is how you have to play it. You say, here's an interface, how would you like, what would you like it to mean? And, oh, you don't need to have it just like this. You can change it. You can say, well, I want something like a scratch thing, like uh, doing some DJ mixing, that's perfectly possible. Or I might want something much more sophisticated and, and designed for, say, someone's fingers and how they might map it onto buttons. And so this is really cool. So we can act, these three interfaces could all be working with the same software, they don't have to be working with different software, but they have, present different kinds of opportunities, different kinds of performance. Um, 
I think I'm doing very well on time. It's good. So uh, at this stage, I'm going to stop for a demo. But before that, we've got any quick questions about what's going on? <coughs> Am I confusing people? People interested? Yes? What's the name of that device you have? Oh, right. sorry about that. This is called a mono. Mono. Yes, look at that. Um, and it's really complicated. Actually, flashing lights. It shouldn't do that. Um, <laughs> lights are what's nice. It's lit up for me. Um, it's so complicated. So I'll, I'll probably spend some time explaining it. It's a box with buttons which are lights. <laughs> <laughs> Change this to um, mirror this place. Okay. Right, we're in. Let's see if it works. So I'm going to actually be using the line or the latest development environment of Overtone, so that's not a good idea on stage <laughs> for a lot of people. Um, and the way to install it is just you pull it as a dependency using Maven. It's running it okay, super simple. Um, and we connect with the slime, we'll use slime, it's a fun. And you just say use overtone.live. And this will do all sorts of naughty things that you shouldn't do. It will actually change state and fire up servers and do all sorts of crazy stuff, which when you put in your namespace, you probably shouldn't do what we do. Uh, and it brings out some nice husky art. There we are. <laughs> so and it's saying, please make some beautiful music. Um, that's very cool. And so here we have a music environment. How cool is that? So I can play some really nap sounds very easily. <laughs> refreshing sound of a sign um, <laughs> that's, the, that's the demo finish. <laughs> Uh, the, the cool thing about it is that we've got a lot of documentation. So the sign asks Fugen, this is one of those boxes that connects lines to lines, uh, has documentation. So I can say uh, ODOC, which is overtone's documentation. You could use DOC if you want to, but because some of the, the, the functions are, are overridden, so like Plus, for example, we will actually, when that's the case, we'll print out both versions and explain why and when they'll actually be called. And also, Close doesn't include the records in all the namespace, so we, we, we do the documentation. So sign ask. Boom. Like that. So this says that. Um, here we have the sign table lookup oscillator. It's got the frequency, it's got the phase, the two inputs. We have uh, default values for these things. Uh, these also can be keyword arguments. So we're actually changing slightly semantics for these things. Um, and output a sine wave with the value oscillator between minus one and one. Exactly what we do. Um, so, at each of the UGENs, 450 of them have documentation like this. Thank you for my summers of, of, of really insanely <coughs> boring acting. Um, but for your musical pleasure. Now, uh, we also have an example system, which is uh, populated with some examples. So, the idea being that for each of the UGENs, we're going to have multiple examples to show how it works. Um, and so, for example, we can look at the examples for DGRAM. Oh, I Yep, and there's one there called Random Walk. We look at this, and uh, there's a font so big. Um, it's a random floating point number walk through frequencies, a rate determined by blah blah blah, with different parameters. Describes exactly what happens, what, what you might modulate, what you might expect, uh, expect to hear. So this allows you to explore what that this UGEN does. We have the source for this UGEN, um, and the cool thing here is it's preserving white space. So actually, the macro which creates this stores this source as text. So we can preserve the white space and use the reader to read it in. So this is actually is the exact code of code which actually executes. Um, we have some examples. And so we can execute that by using demo and then saying as an example. And you can move around. So now you can see the demo runs for two seconds by default, so I can change that to say 10. Ooh. I can move my mouse around. <laughs> well, the point of this is really just to show you what this UGEN does. And so you can actually see on one of the other terminals it's outputting the current values, so you actually can introspect and examine it. So this is not about making good music, this is about learning. Um, and the idea is that when people learn about a particular UGEN, hopefully they'll add some more examples and we can all learn together. Um, and so that's that for the introspective stuff. And so let's go to make some sounds. Uh, So, you know what the THX thing is for cinemas? <laughs> yeah. 
So we've got a really nasty version of that. <laughs> but it's not bad, it's not bad. Understand and communicate with each other. And so the idea is when people are making new kinds of sounds, we can all learn from it by reading, just like we read source code. So this is kind of open, sound, open source sound. Um, let's go somewhere else. Beatbox. So all my examples are basically a plagiarized from the places. Let's see if this works. Um. Yeah. So this is the mono. Press the button. Beat sound. Uh, now each one's got to be a beat. Now 
we're pulling some notes out of that. Um, and the number of notes we're pulling is varying through time as well, so we're getting a bit of a feel. Um, and so we can also change the, the no number of notes we're pulling. So here. This is a scheme version of something to a, to a closure version of something, which is, has a lot of differences. Um, but still, I was able to read the code and translate it, which is, which is mind-blowingly cool. Um, what else do I have? One more thing. Um, post it. <laughs> oh, I should, have, I should have said that... Um, Let's go back to our friendly uh, terminal. Um, 
evaluated. So we have more than one procedure. Oh, and so we are asking for computation or works with me. Um, and so I can take something really whole sounding, like let's go for a saw wave, 100 hertz. Uh, I can do some slightly more interesting. Actually, I can play one at 100, one at 101, one at 99. Oh, so a bit more interesting. This is actually doing weird things. So actually, this is called a, a multi-expansion. So when you actually pass a vector to a function, it actually creates three of the functions running at the same time and mix them together for you. Um, and the things here, we can just say, right, that's something cool, but let's make it into dubstep by wobbling it. Because well, you need to specify the amount of times per second you want to wobble. Um, probably need to put it in the right place. Um, so end of saw. Uh, well, that should be it. I know the other things. I'm going to move out. Because I've built some airs, the cool thing, actually. Um, Supercly doesn't have a safety system, so if you do the wrong thing, it will destroy your ears. <laughs> <laughs> and the number of times I've been the headphones on, designing to see it, playing around, and then, ah! Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and I only realised the pain by the time I've thrown the headphones off the screen. I've got this tinted ablation in the ears, so I've got a serious volume, and I feel actually quite sick for a couple of hours. And so I don't want to let you do that. <laughs> and also, I don't want to destroy these speakers or your speakers. So I built into overtone a safety system. So what you're hearing there, the reason the sound doesn't sound very good is the safety system is picking the sound and making it all safe. So probably what I want to do here is actually multiply that sound by a, by a fraction of 3, 1.3, say. Here we are, dubstep sounds, maybe go a little longer. One line of hopes, look at that. And so the idea is, I'd like you to think about what kind of abstractions you can do that are equivalent to wobble. And then we can all work with them. Now once we've got wobble, that's great, what else can we do? And then we can just plug them in like this, it'd be beautiful. And, and so, as the, the, the way the system is now is I've put a huge amount of technical effort into this. So it's, it's pretty stable, it's well documented. All it needs is more people to actually hack on it, making cool things, making equivalents of wobble, and then we just have a great time to live. Um, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much.